dancers need to take the floor.
friends, welcome to the River Fellowship tonight for uh, the celebration of the Passover. Uh, this gentleman over here that I'm pointing at, the person who's crying already, is Pastor Neil. Uh, it's one of those deals where it's it's one of those things that every time he sees that it it hits him, you know, because that was birth of a nation kind of stuff that happened that night so many years ago. Uh, I'm Nate Lee. I'm one of the elders here at the River Fellowship, uh, and I have been given the uh, awesome task of conducting the service for the Passover meal tonight uh, that we're all going to partake of. Uh, just very quickly, uh, we're going to begin with prayer, and then I'm going to try to give everybody some introductory information that hopefully will help if this is your first Passover meal, because it is one of those things that it's kind of intimidating looking the very first time that you attend one of these, and we want to make you comfortable and help you understand what your role is in this and why this is something that you should care about, the events that happened nearly 3,500 years ago uh, at this time of the year. So let's go ahead and pray before the Father and open up our service. Father God, your name is Yahweh Elohim. This is what you go by so often in your holy Hebrew language. And we thank you, Father God, for your amazing, amazing power and your amazing, incomprehensible love that you would do the things that you did for the people of Israel that night all those years ago, the night that we commemorate tonight, and the things that you have done to keep them and, Father, to keep us all along the way. I firmly believe tonight that it is no accident that the people who are here are here. Yah, it is my great desire that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would come to this service and that one of the many things that you would do here, not just dwelling with us and being with us as we celebrate this feast, but Father, I pray that you would open the hearts of the people that are here tonight to respond to what you want them to learn, what you want them to know, and what you want them to do. And it is my prayer, Father God, Yahweh, that you would make it where the people would understand the great and wonderful things that you have done and that you continue to do, and that we would have our hearts open to you for ministry, for healing, for true change in our hearts and our lives and that those things would overflow in us to grow ministry and change and healing and salvation in the lives of those around us in our communities. Father, may tonight not just have been the birth of a nation all those years ago, but may it be the birth of new life and new uh, inspiration, new power, new destiny in the people that are here in this room. I thank you, Father, tonight for the very hard work of all the, the members of the River Fellowship for their planning in this event, for their preparing this feast. Father, I pray that for every drop of sweat that they put in, every gift of love that they have given to you. Father, I just pray that you would exponentially multiply blessing to them for making it possible for us to celebrate you in the way that you have commanded. You are wonderful and we praise your name, Yahweh. And it is in your name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, I want to uh, welcome you. I definitely need to start with uh, a couple of uh, small confessions Okay, before we start, uh, I taught here at the river a couple weeks ago, and what we were trying to do was make it where 
when we did the Passover Seder tonight that the Seder wouldn't have to take five hours worth of time because there's a lot of backstory that is needed when you try to communicate what is what this is about tonight. And one of the things that I uh, accidentally said uh, was that the people of Israel were enslaved in Egypt for 430 years. Uh, Exodus 12 verse 40 says that they lived in Egypt for 430 years. To be clear, they were not slaves that entire time. So I just wanted to correct that mistake. And I'm just going to tell myself a couple other little pieces here too. You know, on the... <laughs> On WBIR, the local news channel, it said that today it would be unseasonably warm, okay? And when I read that, I promise you, I thought it said that it was unreasonably warm. And I'm not sure that I was that wrong on that. So, first of all, I appreciate you putting up with the fact that we're out here on a 90-degree day and doing this. Uh, Now, I'm going to give you one more, okay? I'm going to give you one more. So, (laughs) the other night, kind of in the middle of worship, you know, I kind of up here with the band some, and uh, I'm in the back. I needed to go to the restroom, so I went to the restroom, and uh, I saw someone that I really needed to have a quick conversation with just really quickly before it was my time to go back up. And I had that quick conversation And then the music played for the next song, and I realized I need to be up on the stage now. And once this song starts, I mean, you got to start singing in like five seconds. You've got no time to think. And so I'm going to make it. I'm going to get it to, to the microphone where I need to be so I can sing. And bless her heart, raise your hand, Care Beth. Go ahead, raise your hand. Bless her heart, Care Beth is standing between me and the microphone that I need to get to. And there's about two seconds left for me to get there. And in my head, what I said to her was, pardon me, but what came out of my mouth was, please move. And I just felt like I was the most rude person in the world. Only two or three people at this fellowship knew that that happened the other night. So I went to her and apologized, but I just wanted to be clear here. uh, I'm not the perfect person to conduct this service. I'm going to do my best to be mistake-free tonight. But as I've just given you three very good examples of, I'm definitely not mistake-free in uh, all that I do. So we are going to start the Passover celebration here tonight. But I want to uh, introduce everyone to Passover who's introducing a Passover service for the first time. And I'm just curious, by raise of hand here, how many people who are in this room tonight would tell me that they are here for a Passover celebration for the first time? Can I just get a show of hands just very quickly? That is more people than I think a lot of people would think it is. So first of all, welcome that you are here. And we have first-timers that are joining us on live, online on the live stream. So, listen, I want you to understand, my heart certainly is with the people who have done Passovers for 40 years. But my heart is much more so for the people who are here the first time. Okay, And I want that to be very, very clear. So for all of you who are new to this, it is my honor to try to help you in understanding why we're here tonight. And what exactly it is we're celebrating. Okay, So Passover is meant to be a multi-sensory experience that helps you helps people have a much deeper understanding of the historical Passover story and how it affects the lives of the people in the time of uh, Israel being in Egypt and in the time that we live in now, like that there's relevance to it. Now, there are lessons for us to be learned. It's kind of like one of one or two of those rides at Disney World. They call them 4D rides. The idea is when you're there, it's not just sight, but it smells and it sounds and it tastes and that all of those things are supposed to be a part of the learning of the story. 
And so I want you to understand we are going to have a lot of very deep symbolism in lots of the things that we're going to do tonight. And make no mistake, friends, whether you've been to one of these for 40 years or whether it's your first time, there are many lessons to be learned. There are many lessons to be remembered. There are many lessons to come. Friends, this is not just the story of the liberation of the people of Israel from Egypt. Or as in the song, as the song called it earlier, because they didn't call it Egypt every single time. The song called the land of Egypt Mitzrayim multiple times, which is the Hebrew word for the land of Egypt. The word Mitzrayim is a very strange word because it doesn't, descri- it doesn't define the place so much. The word Mitzrayim means confined place. It's a tight place. It's a place where you feel uncomfortable. Okay? So that's what that word is supposed to connote. So if you ever hear the word Mitzrayim, it is the Hebrew word for the land of Egypt. This story that we are going to talk about tonight not only is about the people of Israel all those years ago. It's a story A real thing that happened that foreshadows the salvation story through Jesus Christ, who in Yeshua is referred to as Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua our Messiah, for all of us, even in the current day. Friends, the Passover needs to be a multi-sensory experience because research has shown, modern research has shown, that people remember things much better when whatever's being learned is passed on through experiences that engage multiple senses at once. So Yah knew that all those thousands of years ago when he ordained and established this is what the Passover should be and this is how it should operate. And he set those things up to really do a good job to help us call into remembrance his goodness, not just in the time when the people in Israel were in Egypt, but for all time, for our lives. Now, friends, we need to be called into that remembrance because I've heard it said very recently that one of the enemy's most powerful tactics against us is the dimming of our memory. Because if we consistently focused and remembered the works and faithfulness of our God, Yahweh, and if we remembered our identity, our, our authority, and our rights, in the name of Jesus Christ, Yeshua, our Messiah, then friends, the attacks of the enemy would be much less effective against us. So I want you to understand, he works hard to dim our memories, to make us forget the things that we must remember. Because if we remembered them, we would be a much more unstoppable force. So tonight we come to bring ourselves to remembrance of Yah's amazing power and goodness. Dad, if you want to go ahead and put that uh, first slide up. Now, here's some background information that will be helpful as we move through, move through the service tonight. Passover is known as Pesach in Hebrew. So if in anything that we do tonight you hear that word or something that sounds like that word, we're just saying the word Passover in Hebrew. The word Pesach means to pass through or to pass over or to exempt or to spare. We're here tonight to conduct the Passover service, which memorializes the night that Yahweh passed over, that spared the people of Israel in their homes on the night of the 10th plague in Egypt all those years years ago. In Judaism, this night represents a very important remembrance, a very important festival, and it's celebrated by many all across the world. In 2020, a Pew Research Center uh, survey asked Jews whether they celebrated Passover or not. 60% of Jews had celebrated a Passover service the year before the survey, which means they were keeping current with it. And 30% of even non-practicing Jews still attended a service that is very religious in its nature, even though they identified as not being religious people. So this survey, or this service has very deep meaning to the people of Israel to this day. This service, friends, is known as a Seder. The word Seder is the Hebrew word that means order. 
So it's called a Seder because we have a certain order that we will do the prescribed elements of the service in that make up the Passover service. I want it to be very clear that people in different churches, different temples, different fellowships, different home groups that do this all across the world do the things in this ceremony all in different ways and all in different orders. So any Passover service that you attend may be very different than any other one you ever attend anywhere else. Also, this word Seder uh, is related to other Hebrew words. For example, the Hebrew word Sidur means prayer book. So it's the, you will find that there are lots of words that are related in Hebrew, and we're supposed to get that connection that this is supposed to bring us into remembrance, bring us into prayer, uh, bring us into a refocus toward our Father God. Now, each of you has a pamphlet in front of you. That pamphlet is known as a Haggadah, okay? That again is a Hebrew word. That word literally means the telling or the narrative, okay? So many of the things that are supposed to be said and prayed during a Passover service are written out for you in that booklet uh, so that you can easily follow along with the main components of the service, okay? The Passover ceremony stems from the commands in the first five books of the Bible. Those first five books of the Bible are often referred to as the Torah or the Torah. For Israelites to relate to their children the story of the exodus from Egypt and to explain to the children how and why the Seder is done the way it is according to the rules prescribed in Exodus 13 verses 6 through 10. And I'll quote those verses. It says, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. You will notice there is bread on your table that is not leavened yeast roll types of bread that you would eat at Golden Corral. And on the seventh day, there shall be a feast to the Lord. Now we're on the first day of the festival here. There's also supposed to be a feast to the Lord on that day as well. It's just not mentioned in, uh, in this specific part of the scripture that I'm reading. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen with you, and no leaven, no yeast shall be seen with you in all your territory. You shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the law of the Lord, Yahweh, may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this statute at its appointed time from year to year. And friends, this is that appointed day and that appointed time on the Hebrew calendar for this year that we are supposed to begin that festival of Passover. This service is a symbolic way to call us into remembrance of Yah's glorious deliverance of the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt to remind us of Yah's deliverance for all of us from our own personal Egypts that have beset us in our own lives and to call all people everywhere to remove arrogance, pride, and puffiness from our souls. I have a very old Haggadah. So they've been doing this for hundreds of years This Haggadah is called the Union or the Universal Haggadah. It was copyrighted in 1923. And I want to read you a quote from the Haggadah that I just want to make clear is going to guide several of the things that we're going to do. We are very much going to follow this quote. Now, it's referring to an older version of the Haggadah. And it says, quote, The old Haggadah, while full of poetic charm, contains passages and sentiments that are wholly meaning entirely out of harmony with the spirit of the present time, end quote. So I read that quote to say this. I don't plan to try to do things at this Passover meal the way this book exactly says they must be done or the way any other book says they exactly must be done. Or the way you've seen anyone else do one of these services as you've seen many of them. So I please ask if you have been to 40 years worth of Passovers, please refrain from holding me to that expectation of doing it exactly a certain way that somebody else did it. 
because they very well have cha could have changed the order from things that were done before. We have that right. Yeshua, at the Last Supper in the New Testament, intentionally changed certain things in this Passover, did them in ways that they had never been done before, and introduced those changes during his time on earth. So just know that if you're familiar with Seder services from other fellowships, you're going to see some things and maybe hear some things that are a little different than you would have seen or heard in those other services. Now, for those of you who are new to Seders, please know Seders are lengthy services. I'm sure you were flipping through that Haggadah and saw that it reading. You said, oh boy, what are we in for? I just want you to know we will be moving through that the Seder service that's prescribed in the Haggadah as quickly as I possibly can while at the same time trying to do the service justice, okay? But the program plus the incorporated mealtime, there's like an intermission style mealtime in the middle of this. Once you put the whole run time together for the whole thing, it takes somewhere between two and three hours to complete. I'm going to try to keep it much more toward the two-hour mark. Please know that it's advised for you to snack on the food that's in front of you, the fruit, the cheese, the veggies, the unleavened bread, the matzah crackers that you have in front of you uh, as you wait for the formal meal time. I'm anticipating that formal meal time will begin in about an hour, 15 minutes, give or take a few minutes, okay? But I'm just saying, don't be shy, eat it, okay? Now, several things done in the service are done under the assumption that all the people in the audience have been practicing Jews their entire lives since there are many of us in the room that don't fit that description and since many of us in the room never wish to fit that description I will try to make some of the symbols and practices in the Seder more understandable for people who aren't Jews and aren't trying to be Jews as best I can I'll try to help clarify why the components of the service would have mattered to Jews throughout the ages and why they should matter to us, whether we're Jews or not. For example, many of the elements of the Passover service are meant to entice Jewish children to feel certain emotions and ask certain questions about why the parents and all the older people are acting so differently during the night of Passover meal than they would have during other nights at dinner time. So they would ask things like, why, what makes tonight so special? Now, friends, each participant in the meal is expected to drink four cups of wine. But we drink very small cups of grape juice here in this Seder service to keep the atmosphere maybe a little more family friendly. But I want it to be clear, with four very large uh, cups of wine, uh, some people become a little inebriated by the end of the evening. So it becomes kind of a very festive atmosphere toward the end. Now, I do want you to be clear, you might see some very small little cups of grape juice in front of you. You'll just have one. I'll tell you when to drink it, okay? But when, it come, when you need a next one, just know the next one will be brought out. Does that make sense? But we will be uh, having four of them tonight. Now, those four cups of wine represent the four promises that Father God Yahweh made to Israel in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 7, which says the following. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. In Hebrew it says, I am Yahweh. And I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will deliver you from slavery to them. I will and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am Yahweh Elohim, the Lord your God. Uh, at a, excuse me, Yahweh Elohim, excuse me. Who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. There are four promises that Yah made to the Israelites there. Number one, to bring Israel out of bondage, meaning to give them physical liberation from Egypt. Number two, to deliver them from servitude, which meant to give them mental liberation and new identity. Sometimes we can be physically free, but mentally still slave. The third thing he promised was to redeem them from all their dependence on Egypt, which would have given them supernatural intervention, intervention provision, and protection. And number four, he promised to select Israel as the people of the Lord, 
which gave them the opportunity and the access for relationship and intimacy with God. A Seder's format is much like a two-act play with a mealtime intermission between Act 1 and Act 2. Friends, Act 1 is considerably longer than Act 2 is. We will drink these four cups. The first one's drunk early in the Seder service after a a blessing prayer. The second cup is drunk at the conclusion of Act 1 of the Seder. Then you have the intermission mealtime. The third cup is following grace that said after the mealtime. And the fourth cup is at essentially the end of the Seder, at the end of Act 2. Friends, those two acts are split into 15 little parts that we're here to do. All right, here's what these uh, are going to be as we move through tonight. Though we're going to talk about those 15 parts here in a second. At the conclusion of the Seder, the River Fellowship, Pastor Neil wanted me to make sure to mention to you to invite you to stay for a brief opportunity to worship Yahweh, King of the Universe. The point of tonight is not only to teach you about Yahweh and all the good things that he did through all of this, but to then give you a chance to express your appreciation to him through worship. So I want you to understand, you are welcome to come and go as you need. I get it, some of you are getting up at 3 in the morning to go to work. I completely understand that. But just know you're also welcome to stay with us for that portion of our service as well. We would love to have you worship Yah with us at that time. Now, I said that there are four cups of wine. In many Passover celebrations, it has also become customary to have a fifth cup of wine that's called the cup of Elijah to separate, to celebrate Yah's promise to bring Israel to possess the land of Canaan and to remember Elijah's role as a forerunner of the Messiah. Now we know through the New Testament in the Bible that Jesus, Yeshua, said that John the Baptist was Elijah in Matthew 17 verses 11 through 13, which reads, He answered, Elijah does come and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will uh, certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. So friends, Elijah has already come to announce the coming of Messiah Yeshua. But many of the Jews have not yet come to know this. So they and their Passover meals are still awaiting Elijah to come. When that time in the service comes, I will ask a young member of the congregation to go and open the door for both Elijah and the Holy Spirit to enter this place as Messiah has already come the first time and left the Holy Spirit with us. We eat and drink a lot at a Passover Seder. All the food and drink consumed during the explanation of the Seder is meant to be deeply symbolic parts of the Passover Seder experience. And we will address several several of these symbols later in the service tonight. These symbols are uh, the things that you would see on a traditional Seder plate as I have in front of me. And several of you have these things on the plate plates in front of you. Those things include matzah, parsley, moror, horosis, a roasted lamb's shank bone, and uh, what's called the afi komen. We're going to get into all of that later tonight and what it's about. Now we should be now displaying on the screen the order of the Passover service, or at least the way that we will be doing it tonight. We will do several, several things, 15 things. The first thing is we will recite the Kiddush, which is a traditional blessing prayer. We will wash our hands. That's what the moist towelette wet ones are for on your uh, table. Uh, Three, we will partake of the parsley dipped in salt water. Four, we will break what is called the middle matzah and hide one part to be eaten at the end of the meal as the dessert. And that dessert is called the afi komen. Number five, we will tell of the story of Israel's deliverance from Egyptian bondage. Six, we will wash our hands again. That's why you have two wet ones packets in front of you, hopefully. Seven, we will recite the blessing before the meal. Eight, we will bless the matzah. Nine, we will bless the bitter herbs. Ten, we will combine the matzah, maror, and herosis and eat them together as a sandwich. Number eleven, we will partake of the festival meal. That's the actual meal that's been prepared by the 
uh, River Fellowship. So you're not just eating what's in front of you. You will get a full meal here in just a little while. River family, thank you again for doing all that because some of y'all made some awesome sounding stuff. Number 12, we'll conclude the meal by eating the afikoma. Number 13, we'll say grace after meal. Number 14, we'll recite the remainder of the Hallel prayer. And 15, we will end the Seder with a prayer for acceptance of the service. So I just want you to understand, that's what we got to get through tonight, okay? All right, so we will also have a couple songs and performances for members of the River Fellowship, uh, worship and dance teams along the way. And again, at the conclusion of the Seder, you're invited to stay for a short time of worship. If you leave after the Seder, please be blessed, but no, you might be missing out on something very special during that worship time. Uh, last week, we had a service where people were getting healed here in this uh, building, and I just want to tell you that that's something that Jesus could very easily do tonight as well. All right, now with those opening pieces of housekeeping taken care of, let us finally open our Haggadah program booklets to page one and begin the service with two of our young ladies in the church, Grace and Maddie, to come up. They are coming up to light the festival candles. Now, at any point, while they're getting ready to do that, you, at any point as we are reading in the Haggadah, when you see the word company in bold, or the words all read in unison in bold, please say the words given in the Haggadah in unison. I will read them with you so you'll know how to say them and all that at the appropriate time. Also, please know that I might occasionally throw in some extra details in the midst of our reading. So if I pause this, I apologize. Also, at any point in the Haggadah, in the Haggadah, if it says the words we or us, please remember that these prayers are assuming that everyone who is reading them is of Israelite lineage. Okay? So just understand that when you're reading that, we're reading it from that perspective. Grace and Maddie, please go ahead and bless us by lighting the candles now. Barukata Adonai Eloheinu, Melechalam, Ashir Kishanu, Bimitvitavo, Vinatil, Lahadek Nair Shel, Yontov. Barukata Adonai Eloheinu Melechalam, Shehekianu, Vekimanu, Vehegianu, Lazman Haza. Praised art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who hath sanctified us by the commandment and and has commanded us to kindle the festival lights. Praised are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has kept us alive and sustained us and brought us to this season. May, May our, our home, home be consecrated, O God, God by, by the light of thy countenance, shining upon us and blessing and giving us peace. Grace and Maddie, thank you so much. Can we give them a hand? Because that was gutsy what they just did. Very well done. As light for the festival of redemption is kindled by the hand of a woman, we remember that our Redeemer, the light of the world, came into the world as the promised seed of a woman as stated in Genesis 3.15. Now we will recite the Kiddush, the prayer for sanctification of the festival. Let us praise God and thank Him for all the blessings of the week that is gone, for life, health, and strength, for home, love, and friendship, for the discipline of our trials and temptations, for the happiness of our success and prosperity. Thou hast ennobled us, Lord, O, o God, by the blessings of work and in love and grace, sanctified us by the blessing of rest through the commandment, Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath unto the Lord thy God. With song and praise and with the symbols of our feast, let us renew the memories of our past. Praised art thou, o Lord our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all peoples and exalted and sanctified us with thy commandments. In love hast thou given us, O Lord our God, solemn days of joy and festive seasons of gladness 
even this day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, a holy convocation unto us, a memorial of the departure from Egypt. Thou hast chosen us for thy service and hast made us shares in the blessing of thy holy festivals. Blessed art thou, O Lord, who sanctifiest Israel and the festive seasons. Friends, we are about to drink the first cup of wine known as the cup of sanctification. So you will need to lift up your cup. Now, your cup, you'll have to open it, and there may be a little piece of bread on top of it, okay? If that's the case, we'll just set that bread aside because we're here for the wine at this point. Boy, that just went out to the whole world via online. I just said, quote, we're here for the wine. (laughs) Nice. I am totally going to get quoted out of context on that. We ready? All right. Say again. (laughs) All right, here we go. Please lift your cup. And this is the prayer. And we say this together. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam bore pri hagafin. Praised art thou, O Lord our God, ruler of the world, who has created the fruit of the vine. Friends, please drink the first cup. Right. Now, at this point, we're washing hands. So you're getting the moist towelette out. Just one. At this point, we have washed our hands using the towel packets that we had in front of us. Later, we're going to talk again about washing because there was a very important addition that Yeshua made at the Last Supper to the Passover Seder that he did during that night. All right, here we go. You'll notice I've taken on my Seder plate, I've lifted up these sprigs of parsley. Passover is a holiday that comes in the springtime when the earth is becoming green with new life. The vegetable of parsley, called carpus in Hebrew, represents life created and sustained by Almighty God. I now am holding up a bowl of salt water. But life in Egypt for the children of Israel was a life of pain, suffering, and tears represented by this salt water. Let us take a sprig of parsley and dip it into the salt water that you have in front of you to help us remember and understand that life is sometimes immersed in bitterness and tears. Notice that when you do this, if you gently shake the parsley, the salt water looks like tears falling from it. See, it's that multi-sensory perspective that we're talking about. This is one of the many examples of the food at Passover symbolizing something relevant to the experience of the people in Israel, in Egypt at the time of their slavery, but also to the experience of all people throughout all time. Now we will pray a blessing over this that we are about to eat. We're about to eat this parsley. Here we go. You ready? Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam bore pri ha adama. Praised art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the earth. Please partake of the parsley that has been dipped in salt water. Now, note the very bitter taste in your mouth. Notice I didn't tell you that part first. 
This is meant to give people a literal taste, a picture of what life was like in Egypt for the Israelites, just how bitter their lives were. Now, I have uh, three pieces of matzah here in this bag. I'll pull out one of them just to show you. I have three pieces of matzah in this bag that I have up here. It is my belief that those three pieces of matzah are symbolic of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Others that don't believe that they represent those things believe that they represent the three patriarchs of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Still others believe that they represent the three, you know, kind of main types of people that you might experience in Jewish society. Priest, Levite, and common man. Now while the Jews do not perceive these three pieces of matzah to mean Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Passover rules prescribe that the middle matzah, which I'm claiming represents the Son of God, Yeshua, our Messiah, Jesus Christ, to be broken. That's part of the service that Jews do. And they might not be able to tell you why they do it, but they do it faithfully as if it's something that had to happen, that must be done, that is a part of them, that is a part of this celebration. Half of that piece of matzah stays in this Seder dish, which I believe implies Jesus' continued and forever oneness with Yah and the Holy Spirit. He's there with them all the time. But the other half is broken off. It's sent away, and it's hidden. I believe that this symbolizes Yeshua coming to earth, doing his ministry, being crucified, being killed, being murdered, and being buried. I think that's what that picture is supposed to communicate to the Hebrew people. Now friends, after our meal time, it's customary for me to hide that piece of matzah somewhere in this room. And our children will seek out and one of them will find this hidden piece of matzah and I will redeem it. I will redeem it. I will pay back for what is mine. And we will eat it together as the dessert for our meal. Now at this point, I'm going to break that middle piece of matzah. As I said, must be done. I can't believe I broke that perfectly in half. That never happens. You know what, listen, if that pleases you, I've got lots of other tricks that you might could throw me a couple bucks for. <laughs> it is a night of miracles. Well said. All right. Now, the following, what I'm about to say is what often is said in Jewish Passover celebrations regarding the bread. Remember, they might not ha quite yet have the full picture of what they're doing. Okay? This is what they say. Lo, this is the bread of affliction which our fathers ate in the land of Egypt. Let all who are hungry come and eat. Let all who are in want come and celebrate the Passover with us. May it be God's will to redeem us from all trouble and from all servitude. Next year at this season, may the whole house of Israel be free. And I would add to that, may the whole house of Israel be free to see the truth that Yeshua, our Messiah, truly is the Son of God, Yahweh, and the Savior of the whole earth. Now friends, traditionally the Passover meal is very unlike most of the meals for a Jewish family. It would be expected that especially young children would have some questions about why all the adults 
and the older children would be acting so differently at this meal tonight than they would be at any other dinner time. And it became a custom for the youngest child present at the Passover service to ask the following four questions. Well, the youngest child present here can't read because he's two years old and asleep in the back. So we got slightly older children that will be asking questions that are prescribed. The two children selected this year are Maddie and Eli Burkett. If I can have both of you come to the front here where Pastor Neil is, you will be using his microphone. Y'all might want to go around that way saying... So, Maddie, if you will read the first two questions, and Eli, if you will read the third and the fourth one, please. Right here. Is it up there? It says that the battery going hey, Dad, your battery is running low. Have you plugged in your old PZ? Hey, really quickly, we can have them read this without that. That this is this technology thing is not the death of paper. <laughs> All right, Maddie, will you come here, please? That is the first question, starting right there. Do you see it? It is okay. I will kind of need this. <laughs> Go ahead. Why is this night different from all other nights? On all other nights, we eat either leavened or unleavened bread. Why on this night do we eat only unleavened bread? Question number one. Go ahead with question number two. On all other nights, we eat all kinds of herbs. Why on this night do we eat especially bitter herbs? We do not dip herbs in, other, in any condiment. Why on this night do we dip them in salt water and her roses? Thank you. Go ahead with four. On all other nights we eat without special festivities. Why on this night do we hold this favor to the Lord? Maddie and Eli, first thank you for reading those questions. Please give them a hand. We got some gutsy kids in the house. You know, one of these days we're going to start putting the adults on the spot around here. Maddie and Eli, it is both my duty and a privilege to answer these four traditional questions of Passover and to recite, to tell to you the mighty works of our faithful God, Yahweh. And I promise I will answer these questions you have asked to symbolize why the Jewish people do these things on this night and why we are doing these things on this night. Those answers will come later at various points in the service at their appropriate times. So please be listening, each and every one of you, uh, to be sure that you hear the answers to those questions. We celebrate tonight because we were Pharaoh's slaves, bondmen in Egypt. And the Lord our God delivered us with a mighty hand. Had not the Holy One, blessed be He, redeemed our fathers from Egypt, we our children and our children's children could very well have remained slaves there to this very day. Therefore, even if all of us were wise and well-versed in the Torah, it would still be our duty from year to year to tell the story of the deliverance from Egypt. Indeed, to dwell at length on it is accounted praiseworthy. Now, friends, the Jewish people believe that the attitude, words, and deeds of people attending the Passover Seder service would clearly communicate the character of each person. So just know in the Jewish perspective, you're being watched right now. The following are examples of how the hearts and minds of people are judged during this festival. So, Dad, I'm going to continue with the reading. By fitting answer to the questions of each of the four types of sons of Israel, does the Torah explain the meaning of this night's celebration? The wise son, eager to learn, asks earnestly, What mean the testimonies and the statutes and the ordinances which the Lord our God hath commanded us? 
So a person that would ask a question like this, we just said, would be considered wise. How should we respond to that wise person? It says, to him thou shalt say, this service is held in order to worship the Lord our God, that it may be well with us all the days of our life. But the wicked son inquires in a mocking spirit, what mean ye by this service? As he says ye, and not we, he excludes himself from the household of Israel. Therefore thou should turn on him and say, It is because of that which the Lord did for me when I came forth out of Egypt. Notice, we didn't say for us, it was for me. He excluded himself, and then you exclude is what is being said there. For me and not for him. For had he been there, he would not have been found worthy of being redeemed. The simple son indifferently asks, what is this? To him thou shalt say, by strength of hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And for the son who is unable to inquire, thou shalt explain the whole story of the Passover, as it is said. And thou shalt tell thy son in that day, saying, it is because of that which the Lord did for me when I came forth out of Egypt. It is well for all of us, whether young or old, to consider how God's help has been our unfailing stay and support through ages of trial and persecution. Ever since he called our father Abraham from the bondage of idolatry to his service of truth, he, Yahweh, has been our guardian. For not in one country alone, nor in one age, have violent men risen up against us, but in every generation and in every land, Tyrants have sought to destroy us, and the Holy One, blessed be He, has delivered, delivered us from their hands. The Torah tells us that when Jacob, our father, was a homeless wanderer, he went down into Egypt and sojourned there, few in number. All the souls of his household were threescore and ten, that is seventy people. And Joseph, Jacob's son, was already in Egypt. He was the governor of the land. And Joseph placed his father and his brethren and gave them a possession, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Israel dwelt in the land of Goshen in Egypt. And they got them possessions therein and were fruitful and multiplied exceedingly. Now over the course of time, Joseph died and all his brethren and indeed all that generation. Now over the course of time, there arose a new king over Egypt who knew not Joseph. And I would add, and knew not what Joseph had done through the power given him to him by Yahweh to interpret dreams, to, inspire the, to spare the land of Egypt from severe, lamb, from severe famine in the days that Joseph lived. And Pharaoh said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal wisely with them lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when there befalleth us any war, they also join themselves unto our enemies and fight against us and get them up out of the land. Therefore they set out over them taskmasters to afflict them with burdens, and they built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more the Egyptians afflicted them, the more the Israelites multiplied, and the more they spread abroad." And the Egyptians dealt ill with us and afflicted us and laid upon us cruel bondage. And we cried unto the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction and our toil and our oppression. And the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with great terror and with signs and with wonders. He sent before us Moses and Aaron and Miriam, and he brought forth his people with joy his chosen ones with singing, and he guided them in the wilderness as a shepherd would his flock. Yah's goal was to take the people of Israel from Egypt to the promised land of Israel, to give that land to them and to their descendants forever. Therefore, he commanded us to observe the Passover in its season from year to year, that his law shall be in our mouths, and that we shall declare his might unto our children, his salvation to all generations. This is the first time where it says all say in unison, so we all about to read together. 
Who is like unto thee, our Lord, among the mighty? Who is like unto thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? The Lord shall reign forever and ever. Amen. Friends, we are about to take the second cup of wine, which should have been delivered to you earlier. If it's not, please raise your hand at this point so that we can make sure that you will get one. We fill our wine cups to remember our joy in being able to leave Egypt. Oh, by the way, we're not about to drink. We're about to do something that sounds kind of gross, but this is just what they did. Okay? We're about to stick our finger in that wine cup. Pinky finger. Okay? No, you're like, dude, that's the only f finger I could fit in there. I get it. Okay? So here's the deal. You're about to stick your pinky finger in there. And what's going to happen is your pinky finger is going to accumulate one drop of juice on it okay and then what we're going to be tr doing is as we get one drop of juice on our finger we will then kind of flick it onto the little white plate in front of us you'll see why here in a minute I promise some of y'all for the first time are like he must be crazy think I'm about to do that well this is just what they do now we're filling our wine cups to remember our joy in being able to leave Egypt. Yet our happiness is not complete, friends, because the Egyptians, who are also God's children, suffered from Pharaoh's evil ways and from the plagues that they endured. Therefore, we spill a drop of wine from our cups, and we could either use a finger or a spoon, but it's typically a finger. As we say each plague, are you ready? We are about to do this. Where's my plate? Ah, there it is. It's way over there. I need to get myself organized. All right, are you ready? Here we go. You got your first drop? All right, here we go. Blood. You say this with me, by the way. You're going to do it for each one of the ten plagues, so I just did it again. Frogs. Lice. Beasts. Cattle disease, boils, hail. I just spilled, well, I just poured the whole thing all over the Egyptians. I, but anyway, <laughs> locusts, <laughs> darkness, plague of the death of the firstborn. Bless you. Bless you. Now, friends, the next part of the service is a recitation known as Dianu, which is often translated to mean, it would have been enough, or it would have satisfied us. Now, as I said, we might change some things. So last year, I proposed that we change this part of the service in a slight, but I feel very important way. Now, friends, understand the meaning for the change. The intended point of this service, of this part of the service, is to show Yah thankfulness and recognize him for his many amazing deeds for the people of Israel and for all his people everywhere, especially for the people of Israel as they left Egypt and went toward the promised land. However, in this part where that's the goal, the words that have traditionally been recited, at least to me anyway, come across as essentially telling God that if he would have only done part of what he did for the people of Israel, that this would have satisfied them, or that they would, or that they and we would have seen that as enough as all that was needed. But friends, there are a couple problems with that. First is this: when someone gives you an awesome, extravagant gift, if you responded back to them. Something along the lines of, you didn't have to do all that, I would have been happy with less. While you may be grateful in what you're saying, to a lot of people that comes across as kind of insulting and almost ungrateful for the awesomeness of the gift that you gave them. Also, it's clear from the things that the ancient Israelites said in many of the events listed after the night of Passover that they didn't feel that God was doing enough for them even at the times the events were occurring. So it's a little disingenuous to say that it was enough 
and that we feel that way. Further, the traditional Dainu recitation omits the most important thing that Yah did, which was to provide a Messiah, His own Son, Yeshua, to redeem us and save us. So please, friends, if you love the Jewish people as I do, everyone understand, I'm not criticizing the Jews for their tradition. Yeshua, who was a Jew at the Last Supper, also changed the meaning of at least one part of the Passover. So we have precedent both from the, the uh, Yeshua Last, Pas Last uh, Supper and from what the old Haggadahs say to change things when we think changes need to be made. I'm just going to tell you, I really think a change needs to be made here. All right, so the change is easy. It's really easy. We're just going to add one word that's going to change the whole meaning. So I'm proposing two real quick, simple changes to the Dainu. Now, everywhere it says in your Haggadah and up, maybe even up on that screen, anywhere it says Dainu, I am proposing that you say Lo Dainu. We're going to add one word to the front of that. Now, remember the, the phrase dainu means it would have been enough. The phrase lo dainu means it would not have been enough. Which admits that we needed everything that Yahweh did along the way, not just each individual thing he did in isolation. That we're understanding that we needed the totality of what he did. It wouldn't have been enough for him to just do the one thing. We needed him to do all the things. All right, so I encourage you to read it that way. Also, there will be coming a moment at the end of the recitation where I'll be adding one statement to the end of the Dainu list about Yahweh providing Messiah. After that added statement that I will read, I will invite you on that last one to simply say Dainu because that his providing of the Messiah was enough for us. Then feel free to sing the, di the traditional Dainu song as uh, is typically done at a Seder service. By the way, the Dainu song is really easy. You literally say the word Dainu a hundred times in a row. And I'm not saying it's exactly 100, but that's kind of what it feels like. And you'll get the tune, it's easy. Are you ready? Let's begin the recitation. Here we go. How manifold are the favors which God has conferred upon us. Had he brought us out of Egypt and not divided the sea for us. Lo, Dainu. Look at y'all, you're so smart. Had he divided the sea for us and not permitted us to cross on dry land. Lo, Dainu. Had he permitted us to cross on dry land and not sustained us for 40 years in the desert. Lo, Dainu. Had he sustained us for 40 years in the desert and not fed us with manna. Lo, Dainu. Had he fed us with manna and not ordained the Sabbath. Lo, Dainu. Had he ordained the Sabbath and not brought us to Mount Sinai. Lo, Dainu. Had he brought us to Mount Sinai and not given us the Torah. Lo, Dainu. Had he given us the Torah and not led us into the land of Israel. Lo Dainu, had he led us into the land of Israel and not built for us the temple. Lo Dainu, had he built for us the temple and not sent us prophets of truth. Lo Dainu, had he sent us prophets of truth and not made us a holy people. Lo Dainu, and here's the statement that I shall add. And please say Dainu only after this statement. And he sent his son Messiah Yeshua in the flesh to die for our sins and be resurrected from the dead on the third day, that we might be cleansed from all unrighteousness and be made joint heirs with Yeshua to live eternally in heaven with him. And now we all together say, Die Anu, because that in Yah's good judgment was sufficient to save each and every one of us. Friends, if you want to sing the song and you know how it goes, go ahead. Good stuff. 
How much more then are we to be grateful unto the Lord for the manifold favors which He has bestowed upon us? He brought us out of Egypt, divided the Red Sea for us, permitted us to cross on dry land, sustained us for 40 years in the desert, fed us with manna, ordained the Sabbath, brought us to Mount Sinai, gave us the Torah, led us into the land of Israel, built for us the temple, sent unto us prophets of truth, sent unto us Messiah Yeshua to save us all from death and hell, and made us a holy people to perfect the world under the kingdom of the Almighty in truth and in righteousness. I think I might have added that part. You didn't have it. Let all the people in the house say amen. Amen. Now, it's time to discuss the various food symbols that we have in front of us for Passover. You may be wondering what some of these objects are on the table in front of you for. Let's continue in the Haggadah. Should enemies again assail us, the remembrance of the exodus of our fathers from Egypt will never fail to inspire us with new courage. And the symbols of this festival will help to strengthen our faith in God who redeems the oppressed. Therefore, Rabban Gamaliel, teacher of Rabbi Saul, that's Paul the Apostle in the New Testament, who, and this Rabban Gamaliel was a noted sage, declared, whoever does not well, deeply consider the meaning of these three symbols, Pesach, Matzah, and Maror, has not truly celebrated this festival. I didn't ask anybody in the company to say this out loud, so somebody's just going to have to step up, one of you adults, and ask the question up there. Hopefully it's up there. Or maybe it's in the reading. What is the meaning? My man said, what is the meaning of Pesach? Well, let's talk about it. I'm lifting up the roasted lamb shank bone here. Pesach means Peshal or Passover lamb and is symbolized by the shank bone. It was eaten by our fathers while the temple was in existence as a memorial of God's favor. As it is said, is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover for that he passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses during the night of the tenth plague. As God in the ancient watch night at the very first Passover passed over and spared the houses of Israel, so did he save us in all kinds of distress. And so may he always shield the afflicted and forever remove every trace of bondage among the children of of man. Friends, according to the rules of Passover decreed in Exodus, the Passover lamb had to be a male without blemish that was one year old. Now friends, listen to this. I'm claiming Yeshua is this Passover lamb, and you're going to see it and hear it as we read this, or as I talk to you about it. This Passover lamb was tied to a post for three days. At the appointed time, the lamb was slaughtered, gutted, It had a stake driven through it vertically and was hung on that stake. And its intestines were wrapped around its head. The Jews called that lamb the crowned sacrifice because of how they wrapped the intestines around around its head. It looks like a crown from the distance. When Yeshua died, please remember, A crown of thorns was placed upon his head and he was hung publicly on a stake just like that Passover lamb was. This is very clear symbology pointing to the lamb which is going to provide for you your salvation. This is what is supposed to happen to it. So when you see something like that happening, we need to be paying attention That in this case, that person, Yeshua Messiah, is symbolizing that Passover lamb. Now friends, in Psalm 22 verses 13 through 18, because some people say, oh, that's just New Testament stuff. In Psalm 22 verses 13 through 18, it prophesies Yeshua's death. It says, they open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water. Remember, when the spear was stuck in his side, blood and water flowed out. 
and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. That happened to Yeshua on the cross. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. That happened to Yeshua on the cross. And for my clothing they cast lots. That happened to Yeshua on the cross. So friends, I need you to understand something. It's not just that shank bone. All the symbols and parallels are there to convey for us and for the Jews everywhere throughout all time a very clear message. Yeshua HaMashiach, Son of God, is the Passover Lamb. He always was, He is, and He always will be. Sacrifice to save us from our sins and to provide our deliverance and our healing. Friends, on the evening of the actual Passover in Egypt, when the Israelites ate the lamb as Yah directed, I've got more good news for you. According to Psalms 105 verse 37, it says the next day when they left Egypt, that they all left healed. That word is all. Every one of them. And not only did they leave healed, Oh, they left carrying silver and gold that the Egyptians gave them to get up out of there because the Egyptians were scared that not only the firstborn were going to be killed, but that they were all going to die. So they were willing to part with their treasure willfully to get them out of there. So friends, on that night, not only were the people set free, not only were they healed, but they walked out in prosperity. I'm going to need somebody in the company to ask me this next one. The question is, what is the meaning of matzah? Now, Maddie, you helped ask four questions up here. This partly answers your first question that you asked. Matzah, called the bread of affliction was the hasty provision that our fathers made for their journey out of Egypt. As it is said, and they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they brought out of Egypt. There was not sufficient time to leaven it, for they were driven out of Egypt and could not wait, could not tarry. Neither had they themselves prepared uh, for them any provisions. The bread which of necessity that night they baked unleavened, thus became a symbol of divine help. He got them out of there so fast, the bread didn't even have time to rise. But even more than that, friends, the scripture teaches us that one of the symbols of leaven is sin. As 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole dough? Get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast as you really are, for Messiah, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. During the season of Passover, let us break our old habits of sin and selfishness and begin a fresh, new, and holy life before Yahweh our King. I'm going to need somebody in the company to ask that last one. Thank you. What is the meaning of maror? Maddie, this will help answer the second question. So we can lift up the parsley or I could get my hand in that horseradish. I'm going to lift the whole thing up because I don't want to touch that horseradish right now. Maror means bitter herb in Hebrew. We eat it in order to recall that the lives of our ancestors were embittered by the Egyptians. As we read in the Torah, and they made their lives bitter with hard labor in mortar and bricks and in all uh, manner of field labor. Whatever task was opposed upon them was executed with the utmost rigor. As we eat it in the midst of the festivities on this night, we rejoice in the heroic spirit which trials developed in our people. Instead of becoming embittered by them, they were sustained. 
and strengthened. Maddie, that part that I just read helped answer your second question that you asked. You're very welcome. Thank you for saying thank you. That is amazing. You know, somebody must be training you really well, and it's probably your mama. Because it probably ain't your daddy, because that's me, just in case you don't know who that little girl is. Proud of you, girl. In every generation, each Jew should uh, regard himself as though he too were physically brought up out of Egypt. Not our fathers alone, but us also did the Holy One redeem. For not alone in Egypt, but in many other lands have we groaned under the burden of affliction and suffered as victims of malice, ignorance, and fanaticism. This very night, which we, a happy generation, celebrate so calmly and safely and joyfully in this fellowship and in habitations all around the world, was often turned into a night of anxiety and of suffering for our people in former times and in some places in the world in the current time. Cruel mobs were ready to rush upon them and to destroy their homes and the fruits of their labors. But undauntedly they clung to their faith in the ultimate triumph of right and of freedom. Champions of God, they marched from one Egypt into another, driven in haste, their property a prey to the rapacious foe, with their bundles on their shoulders and Yah in their hearts. Because God, the guardian of Israel, who, who sleepeth not nor slumbereth, revealed himself on that watch night, on the night of the Passover in Egypt, and in all dark periods of our past, as the redeemer of the enslaved, we keep this night as a watch night for all the children of Israel, dedicated to Yahweh, our redeemer. While enjoying the liberty of this land, let us strive to make secure also our spiritual freedom, that as the delivered, we may become as the deliverer, carrying out Israel's historic task of being the messenger of religion unto all mankind. So it is our duty to thank, praise, and glorify God, who brought us and our forefathers from slavery unto freedom, from sorrow unto joy, from mourning unto festive gladness, from darkness unto light. Let us therefore proclaim his praise. Hallelujah. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forever. From the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations. His glory is above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God that is enthroned on high, that looketh down low upon heaven and upon earth, who raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the needy out of the dunghill, that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people, who maketh the barren woman to dwell in her house as a joyful mother of children, Hallelujah. When Israel came forth out of Egypt, the house of Jacob, from a people of strange language, Judah became his sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea saw it and fled. The Jordan turned backward. The mountains skipped like rams, the hills like young sheep. What aileth thee, O thou sea, that thou fleest? Thou Jordan, that thou turnest backward. Ye mountains that ye skip like rams, ye hills like young sheep. Tremble, thou earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a fountain of waters. Friends, it is now time to wash our hands in preparation for the meal. So if you want to get that second packet out, awesome. That second packet of wet ones is hard to open after the first one, right? Because your hand's still a little wet. <clears throat> All right, here we go. We wash our hands before the meal, and we say the blessing that should be put up here on the board. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kidshanu B'mitzvatav Vitzivanu 
al nitilat yadayim. Easy for us to say. Praised are you, Yahweh our God, ruler of the universe, who makes us holy by your mitzvot and commands us to wash our hands. Praised art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who hast restored us and our ancestors from Egypt and hast enabled us to observe this night of the Passover, the feast of the unleavened bread. O Lord our God and God of our fathers, may we with thy help live to celebrate other feasts and holy seasons. May we rejoice in thy salvation and be gladdened by thy righteousness. Grant deliverance to mankind through Israel, thy people. May thy will be done through Jacob, thy chosen servant, so that thy name shall be sanctified in the midst of all the earth, and that all peoples be moved to worship thee with one accord. And we shall sing new songs of praise unto thee for our deliverance and for the deliverance of our souls. Praised art thou, O God, Redeemer of Israel. Friends, remember that second cup of wine that you put your finger into? We're about to drink that. Hope you washed your hands before you came in here. Now, the second cup of wine is known as the cup of deliverance. We celebrate that Yah decided to deliver the people of Israel out of the bondage of Egypt. Even today, though, friends, we have spiritual Egypts from which we still need deliverance in all generations. And we read this next part in unison. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, bore pri hagafin. Praised art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has created the fruit of the vine. Please drink the second cup of wine. Yeshua inserted an important practice into the Passover feast, the washing of feet. Let us also reflect upon that gesture of humility and the lesson of commitment made by Messiah Yeshua. When on the final Passover he ate on earth at the Last Supper, he laid aside his garments and girded himself with a towel. According to John 13 verses 1 through 17, Yeshua washed the disciples' feet after he arose from supper, which the supper that we'll have in a few minutes. But I'm bringing it up here because the time for supper is about to commence. The people in Yeshua's time wore sandals and walked through lots of dirt and mud. Their feet would have been sweaty and dirty nearly constantly. In that culture, washing feet was a job that people in society made servants do. This should have been done when they entered the house, but on that night at the Last Supper, it's implied that it didn't happen that way. By washing the disciples' feet, Yeshua showed that it is first coming centuries ago, that he didn't come as a king to conqueror, although he was and is king, but rather as a servant to suffer. But friends, when he returns, he will come as the conquering king. On the night of the Last Supper, the disciples were arguing during supper who among them was greatest. Thank you for not doing that here tonight. I will now read John 13 verses 3 through 15 to set the scene quickly. Yeshua, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet wrong. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you, sh you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew, who, he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, 
you ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given for I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Let us try to understand at least some of the significance of that very symbolic, important act. Yeshua took his clean hands and pure heart and dirtied himself with the filth, not just from the disciples' feet, but from our spiritual feet, from the dirtiest, lowest places of our being. And friends, he washed each one of us clean. But friends, it doesn't just say that he washed their feet. It also says that he dried their feet. And friends, I want to commit to you why he did that. He also dried our feet to make it harder for them to become dirty again. Because if you leave them wet, it's much easier for them to become dirty again. He didn't just clean us, friends. He made it hard for us to get dirty again. It is a picture of the depth of sacrifice that he made when he was crucified. And that is why he said to Peter, if you don't let me wash your feet, you have no part in me. Because if he doesn't clean you, then you're not clean. And he's not in you. Tonight, following the lead of Yeshua, about halfway through the mealtime, we will announce that we are ready to do washing of feet. I'll do it right up here at a chair on the other side as Yeshua did at the Last Supper. Friends, I want you to know, you are more than welcome to have your feet washed tonight. Please don't feel pressured or obligated to do so. It's strictly your choice. But we wanted to offer that, as Yeshua said, ought to be done. All right, now I'm breaking a piece of matzah here. And we're about to read a prayer in unison. Here we go, you ready? Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Praised art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who bringest forth bread from the earth. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kidshanu, b'mitzvatav, vitzivanu, al akilas matzau. Praised art thou, our Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us through thy commandments and ordained that we should eat unleavened bread. Friends, please eat the matzah. Eli Burkett, this next part will answer, will address your, your question, your third question that you asked. On all other nights, we do not dip our vegetables even once, but tonight we dip them twice. We've already dipped the parsley into the salt water, and I want to uh, lift up for you that you have in front of your plate, you have this big, huge portion of uh, this brown apple mixture now, well, mine's huge. If you want some of mine, come get it. Somebody said, mine ain't huge. <laughs> As a, anyway, here we go. The children of Israel toiled to make treasure cities for Pharaoh, working in bricks and clay. We remember this task with this mixture called heroset, which is made from chopped, an, uh, chopped apples, honey, nuts, and grape juice. This combination physically resembles the mortar mixture that would have been needed to build the cities in Egypt that the Israelites built as slaves. It's supposed to remind us of what the work they had to do. So, let us once again scoop some bitter herbs, but this time in the form of horseradish. Y'all about to get lit up. On a, onto a small piece of matzah. So you're going to put some of that horseradish that you have on your plate onto a small piece of matzah. Y'all, we're about to make a little sandwich. Mm. 
Now, but this time before we eat, we're going to dip in some of the sweet horoset into it. So you're making a sandwich that's got both some of the horseradish in it and some of the horoset in it. You're going to want much more of the horoset than of the horseradish. More horseradish? Great. So, I've got my bottom piece of my matzo sandwich. I've got the horseradish on top of that. I've got the horoset on top of that. And then I'm going to close up my little matzo sandwich that we're going to have. Now, we dip the bitter herbs into Horoset to remind ourselves that even the most bitter of circumstances can be sweetened by the hope we have in our God, Yahweh. Now, this sandwich that we made was the practice of Hillel at the time the temple was still in existence. He combined the unleavened bread and the bitter herbs and ate them together to carry out the injunction concerning the Passover sacrifice with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Let us now say the blessing for eating the bitter herbs. Here we go. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kidshanu b'mitzvotav v'tzivanu al alkilas moror which means praised art thou, O Lord our God. King of the universe, who has sanctified us by thy commandments and ordained that we should eat bitter herbs. Let us eat our sandwich. You get a little bitter, but man, you get a lot of sweet. Eli, this next part will address part of your fourth question you asked. On all other nights, we eat either sitting or reclining. But tonight, in the ancient days, they would have sat reclining. The first Passover was celebrated by people enslaved. Once we were slaves, but friends in Yeshua, now we are free. The children of Israel were instructed to eat the Passover in haste, their loins girded, their staves in their hands, their sandals upon their feet, awaiting departure from the bondage of Egypt. Today, may we all take that deep breath, recline, and freely enjoy the Passover Seder. Messiah said, Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. In Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. Well, friends, it is now my honor to say that Act 1 of the Seder, the really long part, is done. Finally, I did that really quickly. You can lay off of me. I said that online. Not yet. According to this. All right. It is now my honor to tell you that supper is served. Now, each table will be told when it's their turn to go, so it's an organized thing, and get food for their meal. Please know that right after the meal, hear me on this, we eat one final piece of matzah as our last dessert. That piece of matzah is called the afikoman. After you eat the afikoman, it is customary to eat nothing else the rest of the night. So please, during this mealtime, have your fill of everything you're going to want during this Passover meal. The supper time will start now at Miss Sandy's direction and will last for approximately the next 50 minutes or so. Be blessed and enjoy the meal. Miss Sandy, will you give direct? Yes, it's time to have a delicious meal of brisket, and it is good. I've already tasted it. We're going to go as tables, so if you will follow your server, um, I will call the tables, and we will start over here at this large table and let you be number one and go with Miss Donna to be served. Coffee will be available with your meal.
Okay, middle table, you're free to go with uh, Miss Rue. We're finished with our Seder plates, so if you would like to throw those away, you can throw those away anytime. Miss Debbie, your table can get ready to go. Abby, Janelle, and Tammy, your tables can go.
friends just very quickly continue to enjoy their meal. You got plenty of time, okay? Don't worry about that you're running out of time or anything. I just want to let it be known that we are ready to begin washing people's feet that wish to have feet washed. It's no rush or anything like that. No obligation. We just want to offer it as the service. So if and when you are ready to do that, feel free and just head over to the carpeted area.
Okay. If everyone would listen up just a second. There is lots of cups of fruit cocktail uh, left over. Um, a pretty fair amount of coconut chocolate dip macaroons and regular and uh, a, uh, about six strawberry sponge cakes. So if anyone wants seconds, they will be on the dessert tray over here and you can help yourself.
begin getting ready. We're going to move on pretty soon.
friends, at this point in time, the River uh, Dance Team is going to be doing a dance here in just a second to open the second short act of our Passover Seder momentarily.
return to uh, the Seder service here. Now you're going to get questions about this if you go to enough Passovers. We've dealt with everything on that Passover plate except that egg. And it's my understanding that at most Passovers the egg gets very little mention. And that that's purposeful, that's intentional. The egg can symbolize many different things. You talk to different Jewish scholars, they'll tell you it means different things. Uh, some, uh, some will tell you that the egg is a sign of mourning. That, it's, uh, that it has to do with the fact that the temple has, has been destroyed in Israel. And that that's one of the reasons for the egg on the plate. Uh, you talk to other people, though, they give you a much more positive uh, message that the egg is a symbol of rebirth, of renewal. And uh, it's because of what it is, right? There's life inside of that egg that would come forth under the right conditions. I also want to tell you that an egg, if you'll notice, obviously has no opening. There's no hole in the egg. And that is to symbolize the mouths of our enemies being sealed shut. Okay? So I want you to understand there's lots of different ways that people interpret that egg, but it gets very little pomp and circumstance. So I just wanted to communicate why we've given it very little pomp and circumstance tonight. Now, immediately after supper, it is tradition that the children who are young enough, I don't know what that means, some of us, ah, Hannah's raised her hand, she's only 37 years old, so the thing that I want you to get is, it's children of whatever age, so I, here's the thing I want you to know, kids, I've hidden this off Coleman, it is not in the carpeted area, it is on this side, and here's what you are looking for, friends, you are looking for a white napkin that is folded and it has a piece of matzah in it. A half a piece of matzah on your mark, get set, go. Oh, did I hide it here again? Like right where I am? No. I wouldn't do the same thing two years in a row. Nice try. Yeah, I know. He was the first one up here because he remembered. Mm hmm. Hey, friends, uh, you know this Afi Komen was supposed to be kind of representative of Jesus' body broken, right? One of the things that happened was people went and searched for Jesus' body when the stone was rolled away from the tomb. So this is kind of representative of that as well. Ooh, I did a little better hiding job this year than last year, apparently. Now, I will tell you this, it's much closer to me than it is anywhere way back there. I mean, it's way up here. You're looking for a folded up napkin with a piece of matzah in it. It's got to be full. My man, he got it. He got it. Raise it up. It's sitting right there. Good job. Come over here, my man. Easy. Come over here. All right, now listen to me. I'm going to do, it's all good, I'm going to do what Yah did with that son that was dead and in the grave. I want my son back. I'm going to redeem him. So I'm going to pay you this $20 to give me that piece of matzah back. Thank you very much for returning to me what is so precious. You can have treasure. All right, my friends, so it is time for you now to share in the Afi Komen. Okay, the dessert, the final food here eaten at Passover. Now, you can use the matzah that is in front of you to represent this, okay? All right. Please remember, after this, you can still drink as much as you like. However, it is customary for you to eat nothing after this, okay? It is shared as representing the Passover lamb that was shared from the time of the exodus until the destruction of the temple. 
By the way, the word afikomen is not Hebrew, it's Greek. It means I came in Greek. It is said that the taste of this afikomen should linger in our mouths. That's why we're not supposed to eat anything after it. This points to Messiah Yeshua. His impact on our lives should linger with us. His salvation should completely satisfy us that we would not try to partake of salvation by any other means, by any other name. That's why we eat it last. By the way, there are some that believe that the Afikoman aspect of the service may have started after the destruction of the second temple in 70 AD. If that were true, then it would have meant that it was not part of the service when Yeshua had his last supper before his crucifixion. So if you're like, why didn't it say they did this in the New Testament? That might be a reason why. Now, Messiah Yeshua broke matzah and gave thanks to the Lord. All right, here we go. Do you have this up here? Nope, fine. I'm going to bless this matzah. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, hamotzi lekim min haaretz. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And we thank you, O Yah, our wonderful king, that you saw fit to bring forth the bread of life, Messiah Yeshua, out from his burial in the earth and resurrect him on the third day so that all of us who believe on him would have eternal life. Now, it was at this point in the service that Messiah Yeshua added the words, this is when he would have said this, this is my body given for you, do this in remembrance of me in Luke twenty-two nineteen. Yeshua's body, like the matzah that we uh, are about to eat, have in front of us, was broken. We broke this, right? It's beaten flat, this, this piece of bread is. It's bruised. You can see it has all these dark places on it from where it gets burned in the oven. It's pierced with little holes in it, and it's striped. What do you think that represents? All those things that Yeshua endured. Now, when we eat of his body in this way, friends, we can claim what his body bought for us. That, friends, by his stripes, we have been and are and will always be healed. Now, let us eat the matzah, of the afikoman, meditating on the broken body of Messiah Yeshua, the Passover lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let us allow the taste of him to linger in our mouths forever. Please eat. In some customs, you bless before the meal. In some traditions, in some cultures, you bless after the meal. And in the Jewish tradition, uh, often the uh, saying of grace is after the meal. So we're going to say grace. And I think you've got this in your Haggadah or it should be up on the board here. Uh, real shortly. Let us say grace. Let us bless him of whose bounty we have partaken and through whose goodness we live. Praised art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sustainest the world with goodness, with grace, and with infinite mercy. Thou givest food unto every creature, for thy mercy endureth forever. Through thy great goodness, food has not failed us, May it never fail us at any time for the sake of thy great name. Thou sustainest and dealest graciously with all thy creatures. Praised art thou, O Lord, who givest food unto all. O God, our Father, sustain and protect us and grant us strength to bear our burdens. Let us not, O God, become dependent upon men, but let us rather depend upon thy hand, which is ever open and gracious, so that we may never be put to shame. Our God and God of our fathers, be thou ever mindful of us, as thou hast been of our fathers, so that we may find enlargement, grace, mercy, life, and peace on this feast of unleavened bread. Amen. Remember us this day in kindness. Amen. Visit us this day with blessing. Amen. Preserve us this day for life. Amen. With thy saving and gracious word, have mercy upon us and save us. For unto thee, the compassionate and merciful one, our eyes are ever turned. For thou art a gracious and merciful king. And in the next lines, all our excitement is supposed to grow here as we're reading this, okay? 
So I don't want you to start out too depressed sounding, but I do want the excitement to build as we kind of read this. All right, so I ask that you read it that way in a sense of growing excitement. All right, here we go. The all-merciful, may he reign over us forever. Amen. The all-merciful, may he sustain us in honor. Amen. The all-merciful, may he bless this household and all assembled here. May we all find favor in the eyes of God and men. Amen. Fear ye the Lord, ye his holy ones, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Thou openest thy hand and satisfiest every living thing with favor. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord. The Lord shall be unto him for a help. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Amen. I like that. That's good. Hey, we should have a third cup of wine in front of us now. This cup's called the cup of redemption, friends, symbolizing the blood of the Passover lamb. It was the cup after supper, as it was called in the Gospels, with which Messiah Yeshua identified himself. Remember that the word says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. The prophet Isaiah reminds us in Isaiah 59, 1, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save. It is our own cheap version of righteousness that falls short. Though the Lord searched, he could not find one. He could find no one to intercede. So his own arm worked salvation for him. And his own righteousness sustained him according to Isaiah 59, 16. Yeshua the Messiah lifted the cup in Luke twenty two twenty, saying... This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Just as the lamb, the blood of the lamb brought salvation in Egypt, so Messiah's atoning death brings salvation to all that believe on him. We shall now bless the third cup and say together, and we're saying this now in unison, Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Bore Pri Hagafin. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Let us gratefully drink the third cup now. You'll notice there's a cup of wine here. We've, we have an entire place setting for Elijah the prophet. So I'm going to lift up Elijah's cup here. This cup is for Elijah the prophet, known as Eliyahu Hanavi in Hebrew. At this time, let one of the children in the company open the door way back in the back. I need any one of the children to go and open the door and welcome Elijah and the Holy Spirit to our Seder and keep the door open until I ask for it to be closed. In Malachi 4, 5, it says, See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. Friends, Elijah did not see death, but was swept up to heaven in, by a great whirlwind in a chariot of fire. It has been our hope that Elijah would come at Passover to announce the Messiah, son of David. Before the birth of John the Baptist, an angel of the Lord said in Luke 1, 17, And he will go before the Lord in spirit and the power of Elijah to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Later, Yeshua spoke of John the Baptist in Matthew eleven fourteen, saying, And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. And it was the same John the Baptist who saw Yeshua in John 1, 29 and declared, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Let us read the following together in the Haggadah, please. Praise the Lord, all ye nations. Loud him, all ye peoples. For his mercy is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Hallelujah. I now ask that the door be closed. Thank you. We're going to continue reading. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endureth forever. So let Israel now say, For his mercy endureth forever. So let the house of Aaron now say, for his mercy endureth forever. So let now, uh, so let them now that fear the Lord say, 
for his mercy endureth forever. Out of distress I called upon the Lord. He answered me with great enlargement. The Lord is for me. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me sore, but he hath not given me over unto death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will enter into them. I will give thanks unto the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter into it. I will give thanks unto thee, for thou hast answered me and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We beseech thee, O Lord, save now. We beseech thee, O Lord, make us now to prosper. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That's out of the house of the Lord. Thou art my God, and I will give thanks unto thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endureth forever. Friends, it's already time for cup number four. That third one, the fourth one goes quick. I hope you got it in front of you. Anybody not have a cup in front of you, it's time to raise your hand if, you, that, if that's the case. All right, so our cups get filled for a fourth and final time, and we give thanks to Yahweh, our great Redeemer. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, to Him who alone does great wonders, who by his understanding made the heavens, who spread out the earth upon the waters, who made the great lights, the sun to govern the day, the moon and stars to govern the night, to him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt and brought Israel out from among them with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, to him who divided the Red Sea asunder and brought Israel through the midst of it, but swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea, to him who led his people through the desert, give thanks to the God of heaven, for his love endures forever. What I just read is an adaptation of an excerpt from Psalm 136. The festive service is completed. With songs of praise we have lifted up the cups symbolizing the divine promises of salvation and have called upon the name of Yah our God. As we offer the benediction over the fourth cup, let us again lift our souls to God in faith and in hope. May he who broke Pharaoh's yoke forever shatter all fetters of oppression and hasten the day when swords shall at last be broken and wars ended. Soon may he cause the glad tidings of redemption to be heard in all lands so that mankind, freed from violence and from wrong and united in an eternal covenant of brotherhood, may celebrate the universal Passover in the name of our God of freedom. May God bless the whole house of Israel with freedom and keep us safe from danger everywhere. Amen. May God cause the light of his countenance to shine upon all men and dispel the darkness of ignorance and of prejudice. May he be gracious unto us. Amen. May God lift up his countenance upon our country and render it a true home of liberty and a bulwark for justice. And may he grant peace unto us and to all mankind. Amen. Let us now lift our cups and bless the name of the Lord. And we pray. Baruch Atadonai, Eloheinu Melech Haolam, Bore Pri Hagafen. Praised art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Please now drink the fourth cup. Now, there are a couple last thoughts that I need to share, and then we're going to move into the next piece. Friends, that last part that was prayed was really important because it's not been fulfilled yet. It is estimated that currently in the world, right now, there are around 27 million people in the world in slavery. Our Passover celebration commemorates the freedom of the people of Israel. But I pray now and I ask that you join me in your hearts with this. And I take authority and command 
command it to be in Yeshua's name that all slavery everywhere in this world, in every aspect, physical, mental, spiritual, of the soul, would be eradicated forever on this earth and in the new heaven and the new earth. And it's in your name I pray it. Amen. I also think it's most appropriate to share a thought that was brought forth by the One for Israel group that I saw recently, which seeks to share Messiah with the house of Israel. I'm quoting them directly here. And like all of us, the Israelites needed a lot of reminding. But Jeremiah writes something curious about the description of God. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when it will no longer be said, as surely as the Lord lives who brought the Israelites up out of Egypt. But it will be said, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites up out of the land of the north and out of all the countries where he had banished them. For I will restore them to the land I gave their ancestors. Jeremiah 16 verses 14 through 16. Friends, the story of God and the Israelites is not over yet. God has indeed brought the Israelites out of the lands of the north from Russia and the surrounding areas and out of all the countries that they had been banished to for almost 2,000 years. But friends, on this earth, he is still not widely known by name for that action. But the days are coming. The physical, practical, and actual restoration of Israel took place last century in 1948. And now we prayerfully anticipate and work towards the spiritual restoration of all of Israel. End quote. Dad, if you please. Oh, daughters of Zion. Oh, Abraham's sons, hear the words of your father, hear his promise of love. I will make you a blessing, so count the stars if you can.
Oh, sons of Abraham, I will wash you with water. I will offer the lamb. Though your sins were like scarlet, they'll be whiter than snow. I have always been. Friends, our Passover Seder is now complete. Just as, our res- re- just as our redemption is forever complete through Yeshua our Messiah, let us conclude with a traditional wish that we may celebrate Passover next year in Jerusalem. But we're going to add one final twist, praying that next year we celebrate the Passover in the new Jerusalem. And we're going to say it this way. You're going to say it this way. Lashana Habaa be Yerushalayim Hahadesha, which means next year in the New Jerusalem. Pastor Neil said that at this point you're free to leave if you wish, or you may stay and worship for a couple songs. We'll play at this point. Either way, we pray that you're blessed in all that you do. Know that we love you and that Yahweh loves you forever. Officially for me, good night and shalom and peace to all of you. Here is promise of love. I will make you a blessing So count the stars if you can You will be a great nation I will give you this land I will bring you back home I'll bring you back home, oh my children You will no longer roam, lost and alone in the night. There is nothing on earth that could take you away. Once I gather you under my wings, I will bring you all back home again. I will.
pierced But don't fear, oh my daughters Or sons of Abraham For I will wash you with water I will offer the lamb Though your sins were like scarlet They'll be whiter than snow I have always been with you I will never let go I will bring you back home Worship your God. 
country supposedly fearless, but all over town and in churches abide. Powerful weaklings who practice their politics, stealing from Jesus his beautiful bride. With your Pharisees, Sadducees, heresies, you best get out.
Hi! 